farm. Women have always played an important part in agriculture, and today we're going to be celebrating some of those women with a little bit of bubbly and some Wisconsin caviar. So first, we're going to head out to Riverbend Winery for some sparkling wine, and then up to Sturgeon Bay for some Wisconsin caviar. Gather with us around the farm table. I'm your host, Inga Witcher. Gather with us around the farm table. A few years ago, I moved up to Wisconsin. I started an organic dairy farm at St. Isidore's Mead. That's when I discovered the abundance of Midwestern local food and small-scale farmers, growing everything from green zebra tomatoes to pasture pork. I'm taking a break from the cows, hitting the road, and seeing if I can't satisfy my epicurious appetite. Oh. That's crazy. This is amazing. Around the Farm Table is funded in part by Wisconsin Farmers Union, Heartland Credit Union, and Friends of Wisconsin Public Television. I'm here with Christian from the Wisconsin DNR. And who's this girl? This is a red-tailed hawk. This is a, an adult bird and in full molt. It's a rather rough condition because raptors are molting their feathers this time of year. The red-tailed hawk is the largest and most common species of hawk we have in the state. Uh, there may be a pair for every square mile in good habitat. Wow. Uh, most folks who have a farm probably know what a red tail is because they're very common in this patchy uh, farmland forest interface. Uh, it eats anything from a cricket to maybe a, a woodchuck. Oh, wow. And it's a generalist feeder, and it's primarily a rodent eater, though. Why do we need to have all the different uh, rodents and bugs and insects? Well, if you appreciate wildlife, then you like to see a good, healthy community. Uh, and basically, if you have a good variety of species, uh, you've got everything that you might like to see and, and some things that you might want to uh, encourage to be elsewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the good and the bad of wildlife, but basically uh, the richer the habitat is, uh, the more variety you see in the species. So now we, we need to kind of have these areas just to support our ecosystems and, and these wonderful animals because it is nice to have the variety and the species. I've noticed here on the farm since uh, I put cows back on this land and really uh, started using the pastures, I've seen so many, so much, just so many changes over 10 years and just being able to see foxes come back to live or yeah. all the birds is just incredible. I, I think that uh, things change all the time. And I remember times when I couldn't see turkeys or, or uh, fishers or trumpeter swans and things come and they go. And we've seen as land changes and the plant life uh, starts to evolve into a higher form. By the way, she just roused. She just realigned all her feathers. Oh, okay. That tells me she's in good condition. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. Basically, all, all different species have different needs. And if the land is constantly in a state of change or, or disturbance, which grazing is a good form of disturbance, uh, nature turns on the spigots and gets productive again, and, and animals respond accordingly. And also, you don't have to have cows on your property to be able to have a system like this. So yes. if, if you have a pasture at home and all these beautiful, uh, the, the space yes. there, that's a, what a great yes. way to bring in wildlife, right? And you can still harvest a crop of hay if you do it okay. carefully. Uh, then you can still produce an income and still have wildlife habitat. Yes. So she's hunting during the daytime and taking right. care of all the, the field mice and things like that. Yes. But what happens at night? She'll go to roost for the night and another bird will start the night shift. And that particular bird is the great horned owl. So do, you, do you think I, we could have a peek? I did have one and I'll give you a look at it. Okay. This is a great horned owl. Uh, this is the largest and most powerful of the owls in Wisconsin. One of 12 different species we can see in our state. It's amazing to see one up close. Those yeah. eyes are incredible. Aren't they? Yes. <laughs> Large eyes, bigger than yours. <laughs> and yet they can only see black, white, and gray. No, no kidding. No color vision. Oh my goodness. And what are they hunting for at night? This particular bird can hunt anything from a cricket to a half-grown raccoon. Uh, they can take about any animal that they can overpower. Now, we're seeing these predators here today. What's the importance of predators? That's a good question. As my career goes on, I hear more and more people continue to say there's too many predators, mm -hmm. there's too many. And, and yet if you really look at the value of a predator, uh, there is an economic value. They're the living expressions of the health and the vigor of our land. 
uh, that tell us first if there's a problem. Uh, they're also indicators of a, of a complete community of animals that support a hunter like them. So if you hear an owl hooting, uh, that's telling you the whole community of animals that's out amazing. there that supports a hunter like an owl. Christian, it's been so interesting to be able to learn about how the ecosystem is a lot bigger than I think it is and how the pasture supports more than just my farm animals. Sustainable agriculture is so interesting and today we're celebrating women in sustainable agriculture with a party here at the farm. I thought I'd pick up some Wisconsin caviar and a little bit of sparkling wine. So why don't we take off and gather the ingredients. I'm here in Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin at Riverbend Winery. I wanted to meet up with Donna and find out how she grows these beautiful grapes for her sparkling wine. And then I plan on taking some sparkling wine back to the ladies. Let's go find Donna. Hello, Donna. Hi, Inga. How are you doing today? Very good, how are you? Good, what a lovely day to be out in the vineyard. Beautiful day. So how, tell me a little bit about growing wine grapes here in Wisconsin. I never think about Wisconsin as a wine state. No, and a lot of people don't. Um, it's, it's kind of interesting now. We've been at this for about 10 years, so we get up in the morning, we come out and work in the vineyard, and it's very normal. Um, and then people drive in here and they're like, wow, this, this feels like I'm in California. This isn't <laughs> what I was expecting to see. So it's kind of unusual for this area. How did you get interested in, in pursuing a project like this? We started the way a lot of people in the Midwest start. We were amateur winemakers, you know, starting in the basement at home. Um, we decided we wanted to take it up a notch. And for my husband and I, it was very important that not only did we have a winery, but we also had a vineyard. So the vineyard came first, um, planted the first vines about 10 years ago. So you're growing your own grapes and you're making your own wine. So right. all the wine that you drink from here is really from here. Right. That's, yep. that's pretty unique, isn't yep. it? Yeah, and you know, sometimes people call and ask if they can buy fruit from us and and no, nope, we use everything that we grow here in our own in our own production and then we work with other Wisconsin growers too. That's fantastic. Yeah. So how did you decide what varieties that you're going to do? You know, around here um, the the climate pretty much decided that for us. So this climate is not conducive to growing something like a Merlot. You need more heating degree days, you need a much longer season and you can't be so cold in the winter. So the varieties we grow here are all from the University of Minnesota's fruit breeding program. Um, it's a program similar to what gave us Honeycrisp apples. Okay. Um, and they have taken grapes that grow here native and they have crossed them with grapes that have wine characteristics. And that's the only reason that wine grapes are grown in this area. Yeah, because, because of that program. What a short season we have here. Right, yeah, <laughs> frost, late frost in May, early frost in September. Yeah, it's pretty short. <laughs> so well, you, now you're doing something that's very unique is you're doing a sparkling wine here in Wisconsin. Is this the climate for it? You know, it is. Um, you know, you need a, a really a warm climate and a long season uh, to grow something like Merlot or Cabernet. This is not the greatest red wine growing area, but it's the perfect area to grow grapes for sparkling wine. We want high acidity, we want low sugar. That's exactly what we get here. So well, that's great. Yeah. Well, when yeah. life gives you short growing seasons, make sparkling wine, right? right? Absolutely. <laughs> yep. So I'm just looking over, what, how many acres of, of grapes do you have here? We only have about five, which is relatively small, but it's 3,000 plants. That's a lot of um, plants. Yeah, and it's a lot of work. Yeah. Is there a certain time of the year when you're uh, pruning the grapevines or is it just you're out here all the time? Yeah, we're, we could be out here all the time from taking off the deadwood from the winter, pruning in the spring, um, taking off extra foliage. It takes us a day and a half just to mow. Wow. The yeah. So yeah, we could be out here all the time. <laughs> all the time. How do you harvest all these grapes? Everybody around here uh, harvests by hand. Uh -huh. So, um, but we're lucky we have customers who love to come and help. So we put the word out of when we're going to pick and we'll get 30 or 40 people a day. How They'll fun. come out on a Saturday morning. We'll pick for a few hours, be done by noon. Um, and they love it because then they get to really feel like they're a part of the wine that we're producing because they got to help pick the sure. grapes. Sure. Yeah. That's what a great experience for yeah. folks. Yeah, they love it. Well, I'm not going to help you pick any wine grapes, but I'd love to taste some sparkling wine if that's okay. We should go do that. Okay. Cheers. Cheers. Well, I'm going to finish up my glass of bubbly, and then why don't you meet me up in Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin, where we'll find out about Wisconsin caviar from Charlie. Tell me a little 
little bit about your business. Well, we're uh, commercial fishermen, but uh, one of the important parts of what we do is that we're food producers. So we have some products we export. We have a lot of local fish that we prepare for restaurants and fish houses. Some of them smoke it, some of them do other things with it. But uh, one interesting part of our business that we do is we actually produce caviar. That's so exciting. I never thought of Wisconsin as being a place to find caviar. Any kind of fish egg can be made into caviar by processing it and have it ready to eat. So what type of fish do you use for your caviar? Well, we do white fish, and that makes a project, product called Lajram that we sell to people in Sweden, and we also make Sikram, which is also sold in Sweden. So this is, you're not just selling this at the local farmer's market. No, you know, uh, amazingly enough, there's not a huge uh, domestic demand for it. So most of our caviar goes either to a company in Canada that then exports it, or we export it directly. That's amazing. Yes, yeah, it's a pretty neat little niche here. Yeah. And it goes back, you know, 100 years in the lakes here. Wow. Yeah. Now, whenever I think of Wisconsin, I always just think of cows and corn and everything like that. How did you get into the fishing business? Well, I moved to Door County, Wisconsin, which is surrounded by water, and I love being here because I was a water person. And I had some uh, local commercial fishermen ask me to start helping them 45 years ago, and one thing led to another, and uh, here I am. Is this a seven day a week job? Not all the time. I mean, there's sometimes in the spring or in the fall, we're at it steady. Sometimes, you know, you need that catch up day if you're fishing six days a week. But with our trap nets, with the live entrapment, we can produce our fish in four or five days and then kind of schedule our, our processing so we have it when people want it. That's nice. What kind of, do you have to think about the environment at all when you're doing your fishing? Is it, do you have to kind of make sure you're not taking too much fish or making sure oh, the water's oh, yeah, yeah, Absolutely. The, uh, you know, the water quality, which is improving, but some of the improvements have made some changes that have affected us because of the, the, the zebra mussel and then the quagga mussel, the water's got clearer. But what that's caused is the cladophora and the other uh, plant life in the water to grow faster. So that's changed some stuff. And the clear water has changed how the fish act in the lake. So we actually do better in lower Green Bay where the fish are more plentiful, but the water has a, a you know, it's, it's not as clear. Uh -huh. It's clean, but it's not as clear. Uh -huh. You know, there was a huge population of fishermen in Door County. Now there's, and there's many less of us now. But, Why is that? Well, partly regulation, partly just, uh, uh, you know, the economy of scale. Right. It's uh, very difficult to be just a small little farmer. You know. A small and a small little fisherman. I hear you, yeah. So, uh, so having a, a big enough operation where you can keep it rolling, you know, makes it makes it easy. And is that kind of why you wanted to diversify into doing the caviar? Absolutely. Every chance we get, we try to diversify. You know, if there, we could fish a different species or a different area or. Uh, or create a different product. You know, we, we've always tried to do that. Well, I would love to have a little sample of the oh, well, we got uh, some caviar. Ready. And I tell you what, I'm not. I'm, I'm more of a land creature, and I'm all the shaking. Yeah, <laughs> it's well, making me wheezy. <laughs> all right. I love Aquavit. Oh, it's a great drink. I think it's underrated. It's uh, it's been a family tradition in my uh, with my Danish relatives my yeah. whole life, and yeah. uh, they would uh, regularly have a shot or two and had special glasses for it, and would uh, at every family celebration at least have a toast with yeah. it. So, yeah, yeah. When I was a yeah. kid growing up, once a year, my parents would invite over my dad's Danish relatives and have uh, aquavit. Aquavit. Yeah, I think my relatives did it more than once a year, but. <laughs> <laughs> What, what do you guys say? Do you say skull? Skull. <laughs> skull. And we have uh, lajram is the Swedish word for it. All right. Yeah. And is that because it's a specific it's, uh, variety? It, it's a specific variety. It's, it comes from our freshwater chub, which is uh, 
a pretty unique thing. It's similar to herring caviar, but it's got its own little niche in the Scandinavian countries. What, what flavors are you tasting for when you're Well, you you know, the what you really want is you want a, uh, a, a fairly firm egg. You don't want it hard, but you want it fairly firm. Mm -hmm. And uh, it has a very light salt. There's a, a little bit of preservative in it. And then, uh, you know, you want the egg taste. Right. So I imagine it's healthy for you. It is. There's a lot of protein in it, and, uh, uh, you know, it's good stuff. Well, I'm going to take another swig yeah. before I have a... You got to get yourself ready for this. I got to get myself ready oh, for it. Oh. <laughs> I'm not as adventurous as one might think <laughs> when it comes to eating. Oh, well, you try this and you're going to like it. Mm. You just kind of roll it on your tongue and taste it. Now, Is that an appropriate amount? That can be. You know, some people eat caviar very daintily with a Should silver spoon. Should I put spoon. my pinky? You know, well, you could. You <laughs> could. I don't think I can get mine uh, held up there. I'll hit myself in the forehead. But, uh, <laughs> but my good friend from uh, Lobster Seafood tells me that uh, you should pile it on your cracker so it gets in your mustache. <laughs> and uh, that's how he likes to eat it. I'll have so. to work up to that egg yes, roll mustache yes, before I get yeah, there. Yeah, you're not going to be able to do that. Yeah. So... It tastes wonderful. I can yeah. I get that little bit of salt, but it's a nice salt. It's a very nice salt. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. When very you nice salt. when you have it at home, what do you do with it? Do you? I usually just put it on crackers. Uh, yeah. Once in a while for the holiday, we'll make a uh, a uh, dip, you know, with some cream cheese and some oh, onion right. and some garlic, because then people who won't even try the eggs will eat it and go, wow, that's really good. <laughs> but you have the other stuff with it. So, but uh, but we eat it like this. Well, good. Well, I'm going to finish up my Aquavit here with Charlie, and then I'll meet you back at the farm to get ready for the party. Today, we're celebrating women in sustainable agriculture, and I thought a fun way to do that is with a little bit of bubbly and some Wisconsin caviar. The first thing that I wanted to do is make a buckwheat bellini. I think it's a classic way to serve caviar, and I think the ladies will love it. The first ingredient is buckwheat flour. Buckwheat's a nice cover crop to grow in your garden because it attracts bees and the honey from it tastes amazing. And now some all-purpose flour, a little bit of sugar, some yeast, and a pinch of salt. Whisk all the ingredients together and for the liquid, it's warm milk with some melted butter added. Once this is all whisked together, I'm gonna let it sit for a half an hour so it can rest and the yeast can do its work and everything can come together. Now that the batter's had a chance to rest, I'm gonna add two eggs before I grill it up on my griddle here. And of course, for these ladies, I'm using my sustainably raised chicken eggs. Okay. Now just whisk these in. Get them on in, come on guys. It's kind of like making pancakes. It's very, very similar. Now that the eggs are mixed in, I'm gonna cover my griddle with some melted butter so that these don't stick. Let's see, get it all over the place. And then since these are gonna be hors d'oeuvres, finger foods, I wanted to make sure that I don't pour too much batter, so I'm gonna use a tablespoon to measure out uh, the, the size of the bellinis. Now those will cook for about two minutes on each side and then they'll be ready to go. I'm gonna finish up frying these and then we'll get ready for our next hors d'oeuvre. Next, I wanted to make my mother's deviled eggs. I think it'll be really nice to have a little caviar on some deviled eggs. So one thing that my cousin Cece taught me just to stick it and get into the yolk and then move the egg around the knife. It, it'll make it a nice cleaner cut, she says. And I believe everything she says. Pop this out and it kind of worked. And then we'll just discard our yolks here. 
One thing I've found when I'm using fresh eggs off the farm is that the, the fresher the eggs, the harder they are to peel. So I like to use eggs that have been sitting in the fridge for about a week for my deviled eggs. They just peel a lot nicer. Also, you can add a little bit of vinegar to the water when you're boiling it to help the shells come off faster. Once you have all your yolks out, go ahead and give them a mash. I just use a regular old fork. And the thing about deviled eggs is you can be as creative as you want with them. I think that's what's fun is everyone has their own version. And depending on what's in season, you can add different seasonal herbs or even a little bit of spice. But I'm gonna keep these a little bit basic because I wanna show off the caviar. I want that to be the flavor that really comes through. To my egg yolks, I'm gonna add a little bit of vinegar, some Dijon mustard, and of course some mayonnaise. When you're doing a recipe like deviled eggs, you can go ahead and taste as you go. So if you need to add a little bit more vinegar, go ahead. Or maybe you want a little bit stronger flavor with that mustard. And mix and match taste test as you go along and find out what works for you. I'm gonna add a little bit of salt and pepper here. Mix that in. It looks good. Summertime eggs are the best eggs. My chickens are out eating grass right now and it just really makes the color of the eggs so vibrant and pops. Okay, once that's mixed up and you've taste tested it and you've got it to where you want it to be, add it right back into the egg. And once your eggs are all filled, now the fun part begins. Now we can do a little decorating. I think it's exciting being in Wisconsin where we have such a diversity of, of ingredients to use. And when you're using an ingredient like this beautiful caviar, you don't want to use too much and you want the flavor of that saltiness, that nice little oceany flavor to come through. So I'm just going to do a dollop on top. The spoon I'm using here for the caviar is actually made out of bone. I didn't want to use anything that ha would leave a metallic taste on this delicate caviar. Lovely. I just want to add a touch of color. I think we a lot of times we eat with our eyes as well as our stomachs. So I wanted to add a touch of green just to make it look very delicate and hopefully stylish. Okay, they look pretty. Now let's plate the bellinis. And these are another simple plating scheme because like I said before, we just wanna really showcase the caviar. So I'm just gonna use a little bit of sour cream here, a little bit more there and just kind of move it around a bit. And I could have almost made these bellinis just a little bit smaller, but this'll be fine. Now they don't have to stop for lunch on the way home. And again to these, I'm gonna add a little bit of green to make it look beautiful. And I thought this time I would do some dill. I think that'll be a nice addition. This looks pretty. And I'm not gonna skimp on the dill either. Add a nice little flavor to it. And now another dollop of caviar. See how the it looks nice on that bed of green. Instead of putting the dill on top, it's a nice little bed for the caviar. Well, the wine's chilled and the hors d'oeuvres are set. So let's go out in the pasture and do a little cheers to women in sustainable agriculture. <laughs> Ladies, to us. Cheers. Women in sustainable agriculture. Lisa, you were the one that spearheaded the whole Women in Sustainable Agriculture Week. Why was it important to do that? Sure, well, women farmers in Wisconsin have increased over 25% in the last 15 years and are leading the Midwest in those numbers, so it's time to celebrate That's and really exciting. showcase what we're doing. So is, what resources are there for women who maybe don't have uh, their, a generational farm or they're coming in for, for a fresh career start? Sure, and that would have been me 20 years ago, <laughs> you bet. So we're real fortunate here in the Midwest to have MOSES, the Midwest Organic Sustainable Education Service, and I have the honor of working with them and directing their women farmer training program. So we have in her boots workshops on farms and resources and events going on throughout the Midwest all year long. So it's particularly a warm invitation for women who harbored those farm dreams and haven't told me yet come on out and then on a local level it's really getting together with other women with sustainable agriculture as a priority and sure. meet regularly so down in my farmhood in Greene County we have a group of over 120 women the wow. Greene County area women in sustainable ag that have been 
meeting regularly now and actually have a whole weekend called Soil Sisters, a celebration of Wisconsin farms and rural life where we go public, open up our barn doors, do farm tours, culinary events, on-farm workshops, but it all happens because, as you well know, women get a lot of things done when we meet Absolutely. regularly for potlucks <laughs> over good food and wine, so just get that going. Well, this is fantastic, ladies, and I'm so glad to be able to be with such a wonderful group of women in agriculture. Cheers to women in sustainable agriculture. Cheers. Cheers. Pop a bottle of Wisconsin Bubbly to celebrate women in agriculture. A different Door County twist on deviled eggs. Buckwheat Bellinis with creme fraiche. And a dab of Wisconsin caviar. Roasted potatoes with a touch of caviar. Well, I hope this has inspired you to celebrate all the women in sustainable agriculture. And I hope you'll gather with us next time around the farm table. I'm your host, Inga Witcher. Cheers. Cheers. Around the Farm Table is funded in part by Wisconsin Farmers Union, Heartland Credit Union, and Friends of Wisconsin Public Television.